Hey folks, it's Andrew Kilpatrick here, and today I'd like to talk about MIDI stream parsing. Uh, this is something that I was emailing with someone recently about, and they were asking me some questions about how they should implement their own MIDI receiver library uh, or receiving parsing routine in their microcontroller project. So I thought I'd go over it a little bit and uh, talk about some ideas in how you can do it and then I'm going to show an example of some open source code that I've used in a project and even though we're living in the days of high-level APIs and things um, byte streams and stuff like that still exists even in fairly high-level software so uh, let's look at this this is a diagram that exists in the uh, MIDI spec MIDI 1.0 spec um, and I'm not too fond of flowcharts like this. I know some people um, maybe are more familiar with this. It's sort of, to me, it sort of seems like a kind of archaic way of describing things when we mainly talk in terms of pseudocode or just looking at code examples nowadays. Uh, I know this can be useful. Uh, the guy that I was emailing with um, was uh, pointing out a potential bug. <laughs> or a, a mistake in this diagram down here with this should actually probably say greater than or equal to. I'm quite sure that he's correct in finding that error. I've never really seen this before or haven't studied it very much because when I first did my first MIDI implementations I had like a not this full downloadable spec. You can get this off the MIDI Manufacturers Association's website at midi.org but uh, when I first started doing MIDI, I don't think it was freely available or it was hard to find. And the one that I ended up using was uh, like an abridged version, which had some of the same pages. It was like a scan of some papers. And I don't think it included this particular part. This is on page 93, by the way. And I think my, own, my original one only had like a few dozen pages. So the, if you're into flowcharts and stuff, you can follow this kind of thing. But I think it kind of overcomplicates uh, the way that it describes uh, how to do the parsing and it also has one other problem which is that it it sort of uh, describes the code structure or the way that you would do the code design which is obviously whoever designed this diagram um, probably wrote their code that way and then they're sort of trying to pictorially describe it to other people um, that's not really how I did my design they're talking about storing things in buffers and incrementing pointers and stuff like that. I don't particularly like that way. <laughs> and I'll show you my way, which is more of a low-level hardware kind of concept using a finite state machine. Um, and as far as I'm aware, I've been doing sort of serial type protocols for a long time because before I did music stuff, I worked in a lot of... Uh, projects that were doing like control systems and things like that where they have like a serial connection or a USB serial connection where they're sending control commands and I didn't use MIDI for those but I had my own sort of protocol that was based around sort of serial RS-232 style of parsing so that's kind of the way I learned how to do it from reading some tutorials like ages and ages ago but let's just jump into some code and I'll describe really what's going on. Um, the basic idea, well, before we go to that, let me just explain the basic concept here. A MIDI message can have one, two, or three bytes. And there's different classes of messages. There's channel messages. There are system real-time messages and system common messages. And then there's also sysx messages, which is, I guess, a, a form of sy system common message, or sort of related to that. Um, and all the messages can have one, two, or three bytes, including the status byte, which is the first byte in every message. And they can uh, accept sysx messages, which can have more bytes, and then up to as many bytes as you want, and then they can end later on. So the point of this diagram is basically to say for certain types of messages you can expect this many bytes or that many bytes or whatever. Um, 
So, and also there's another thing to MIDI which you don't encounter really when you're dealing at the, like in, if you're writing a music program, you almost will never see this, which is called running status, which is a form of compression that was designed into the original MIDI spec, mainly made for DIN MIDI cables that have a low baud rate. Um, so the running status, the idea is like if you play a big chord, let's say with like both hands, you're going to want to send all those events nearly simultaneously, but as we know, MIDI, DIN MIDI isn't very fast. So if you send three bytes for every message, which would be the normal way, you have to, it takes about one millisecond or so per message. So there's uh, obviously some latency there. Um, so to get around that, they implemented this thing called running status, which means if you're sending a channel message, like a note on or off, and the message status doesn't change, which means you're sending on the same channel with the same kind of message, like note on, channel one, let's say, if you send a whole bunch of those, you don't have to send the status byte for every message. You can just, the receiver can remember and assume that the next bytes that come in are also the same type and on the same channel. So that is like a one-third savings, which for, you know, for the simplicity of how it works, it's actually pretty, pretty good in terms of saving, saving bandwidth. So you get a, a speed up. So instead of sending three bytes, you only need to send two. Um, if you don't handle running status properly, you may think your implementation is cool. This is what happened to me when I first started implementing stuff like this. And then you'll plug it into a keyboard. In my case, it's a really old synthesizer that does implement sending of running status. And I all, all of a sudden wondered why my notes were sometimes not working. <laughs> and uh, that's the reason. So you have to implement running status, especially when you're sending, doing a low level um, parser. If you, are send, if you are working at the application level, most likely the driver or the MIDI API in your operating system or whatever will take care of that for you and they'll fix that by putting the status byte in because obviously sending data between software applications is a lot faster than sending it over the wire. So they don't really care about having the extra byte in there. Um, oh, and there's one other thing, which is a little bit more of like a, an application layer thing, but it's still good to think about, which is that there's a special case for note off messages as we know, there's note on and note off are two different status bytes, but in most cases, nobody uses the note off type. They just use a note on with the velocity of zero, which is, should mean the same as note off. So obviously you have to handle that specially. Um, some software will just convert it into a note off, which is just handy because then uh, further up the chain, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but basically that's another form of, of keeping the running status from changing because if you're playing like a run of staccato notes or something, you're going to be sending on, off, on, off, on, off. So if you can just send on, 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 obviously you don't keep resetting the running status. So let's look at some code and I'll go through a little bit of how this works. So this you can download. This is a code from the carbon sequencer project that I did, um, which is a commercial a hardware sequencer. This is basically how I go through it. So basically, I deal with one byte at a time, even if I receive data in chunks, which happens over USB, for instance. Um, and this is also a stream system. So internally, um, the hardware, the Carbon hardware, you can look it up on my website, um, but the Carbon sequencer hardware actually has multiple MIDI ports. It has two USB ports and three DIN ports, two outs and one in. Plus it has analog outputs and it has a whole bunch of other stuff that it uses internally with MIDI streams to go between different threads in the application. So it actually has a multi, it, it handles multiple streams of data essentially um, so that you can pass MIDI between different parts of the hardware and software. So the first thing is when you receive a status byte, the most significant bit will always be set. That ha that's how you know that it's a status byte. And that's also why 
MIDI only has 7-bit data bytes for things like controller numbers 0 to 127 or 1 to 128 and also the values and note numbers and everything like that. <clears throat> so the first thing is we see a status byte. Okay, this is where we have to do something to figure out what's going on. So we make a temporary copy of the status byte and we split it into its two parts. The status part and the um, channel part and that's only for a, a, a message that's a uh, channel message. Channel messages have the status part encoded in the top four bits and the channel number 1 to 16 or 0 to 15 encoded in the lower four bits. So one thing is when you're parsing these kinds of messages, especially channel mode messages, it's easier to just compare the status part and then you can, you know, deal with the channel separately. So, first of all, if we have a system message, we do something special here. So these are messages like clock messages, song position pointer messages, things like that. Um, we clear the channel for the running status because we know that, that that will reset whatever is happening. So certain types of messages reset the running status and certain ones don't. And you need to read the MIDI spec to figure out exactly the rule for each one. But basically, the purpose of that is that uh, real-time messages, which are only a single byte, they're only a status byte, things like clock ticks, start and stop, and things like that, those can in appear right in the middle of another message. And to, in order to not disturb what's going on, basically, if you see that kind of byte appear, you should do something with it right away, and then go back to receiving the rest of the other message. Now, on a MIDI cable, I can't really think of too many examples of where that where you would actually get that in this day and age. The only thing I could think of would maybe be like a drum machine or something that is sending clocks and also notes. Um, certainly if you use a MIDI and to USB adapter, you probably will never see interleave data like that just because I think the software that's packing all the bytes in the buffers would not bother that with that. Um, but you still have to assume that that could happen. Um, so if I get, let's say, a song position or song select message, these both have an extra data byte or two that are needed. We set the stream, uh, the state for the stream, into this data zero state. Now notice that we don't care what state we're in if we get one of these because it doesn't matter. If we were in the middle of receiving another message and you unplugged the MIDI cable and plugged it back in again, the moment that we get a status byte, we reset uh, what state we thought we were in. So this is the idea of a finite state machine, is that you're always in one state. Because we need more data bytes, we set the, the state to data zero, and you'll see that in a second. Um, for single byte messages, you'll see that this I actually don't handle here because I don't have anything that needs that. Um, but all these other ones, you can see we encode. I have another utility um, library that encodes messages with certain data. So we make a message. The MSG is, um, is this MIDI message, which is a, a, it's a struct that contains the data of a MIDI message. So we encode a message for a timing tick, and then we send it to wherever it's going. And the stream has already been encoded in there with this number, port. And that's how you put a byte into a certain port or a message into a port. System reset, we just reset some stuff. <coughs> and then we put that into the, the stream as well so that maybe we want to reset some other stuff. SysX messages are handled separately. I don't think I'm going to talk about that this time because that's a little more complicated. And actually, a lot of software and hardware actually gets it wrong. Um, but let's just say SysX messages can come in parts. They have more than three bytes normally. Actually, almost always, they would have more than three bytes. So we have to sort of remember that we're in a SysX state and that we have to put the data somewhere else um, because it could be longer. Uh, we have to have some maximum length that we can handle. So let's not get into that right now. So if we get any of these bytes, we do these things. This is a catch-all that just resets stuff if it's a byte that we don't recognize because there are actually some 
uh, MIDI bytes above F0 that don't have an assignment. So we just have to make sure we don't just do something weird with that. So that just would reset back to idle, which is the normal state that we're in. Let's deal with the channel messages. So we already know the status because we chopped off the top four bits, as you could see above. We know that we, if we get one of these, we're going to match on one of these. They're all assigned, so it's easy. There's still a default case, but we don't really care about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we're going to store the channel and the status in our received buffer, which is the sort of temporary buffer that we have, because we know we got something valid here now. And then we're going to change the state to data zero, and then we're, we're going to get out. So we've received our second byte in the message. We know we're in this state now because it, the first byte was one of the ones that requires at least one more data byte. So we come down here, we look at the state of our port, and we know, hey, we're in data zero state. Okay, we store the data zero byte in our port. This is the send byte that came in f to the top of the function. Then we deal with it. Here are the three types of messages that can use this as their only data byte, and then that's it, we're done. And then we get uh, this byte, we encode it in a message, we send it into the stream, and then we reset the running status and go back to idle. So if we get more data bytes that don't have the MSB set, then we, we won't do anything funny. If we get a program change message or a channel pressure message, these are channel mode messages, so we're going to encode those, send them into our stream so we can handle them somewhere else. And then we're going to stay in the state because we could get another data byte like this to change the program to another program or whatever. And that would automatically get handled here because we never changed the state back to idle or anything else. So we get another byte, it will just end up right in here. If it's anything else, if it doesn't, if the state the status isn't one of these things, then we assume that it's another byte that we're expecting, like any of the other channel messages um, requires two data bytes. In that case, we default here, this is the sort of the catch-all, we switch to the new state, and we get out. We don't return, we just break, and we won't end up in here. In this case, now we are using both bytes. We actually don't need to store this, but anyway, I'm just I think I was just being overly consistent or something. But So let's say we get a node off message. We just go and encode a node off, and we put all the data bytes in, send it into our stream, and then that's it. And we know because of running status, if we get to the bottom of here, see, we loop back to the, to the first byte, because we know these kinds of messages need two data bytes. For note on messages, now note, notice we have the special case here. If the data one byte is zero, that actually means that we want a note off. So for, for convenience, up higher up in my software stack, I guess, I just switch this into a note off message. And then the rest of this is for um, the sysx, which we can talk about another time. Anyway, I hope this helped you. And uh, Leave some comments if you have any other questions or if there was anything that I wasn't clear about, but I hope that this helps you if you're looking at uh, parsing MIDI messages, and maybe this even gave you an idea if you're trying to parse other kinds of messages. Anyway, thanks for watching.